hello and welcome to another episode on Design to Connect. If you're new here, uh, Design to Connect is a podcast where we try to have conversations uh, that really tries to question and rethink the current ways of imagining and practice in architecture. And season two is mainly about uh, connecting being and focusing on uh, people that are uh, using design to uh, reduce inequalities and uh, create a positive impact. And uh, our today's guest is doing that from a feminist and an inclusive perspective and lens. Uh, she is a social entrepreneur, educator, feminist urbanist, city enthusiast, and uh, a community lover. Her name is Nurhan Bassam, and she's connecting with us from Lecco, Italy. Hi, Nurhan. Welcome to the podcast, and thank you for being here. How are hey, you? Hey, Elisa. Thank you for having me. Great. All good. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, I, I I actually love Leco. I, I lived there for, for a year. Last year I was living there and I, I really love oh. the city. How long have you been? Yeah, there? it's it's a, uh, actually uh, since 2017, but on and off. Uh, but uh, since long time, uh, I love it uh, because it's really simple, and uh, and you know it's not uh, a fiasco of a city. But uh, I think I'm more a city girl, to be honest. <laughs> Being born in Dubai, uh, it's uh, and and be and living lived in Cairo. I'm Egyptian, so it uh, it really makes me more a city girl. So um, Milan for me is more like energetic, but it can get chaotic. I. I <laughs> Yeah. I know, but that's why, like, uh, Leco is really uh, this uh, tranquilo uh, side of uh, of Lombardia. But uh, but I think I am a city girl in in heart. So I'm not sure if I'm like be in Leco forever. But okay. yeah, so now I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a good balance between nature and having people around. And then, yeah, you never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, so you you are doing your PhD right now, and your PhD work is focusing on creating sustainable communities. And then you do personally a lot of work that is focused on feminism and kind of amplifying women's voice. So wh why don't you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing? And yeah, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, yes, I'm in my uh, final stages in my PhD that uh, focuses on sustainable communities uh, and uh, how to endorse and foster creative active, uh, active citizen participation. Uh, it's about creative placemaking and citizen participation, uh, and especially for marginalized groups and low income uh, in low income neighborhoods. And this is where my gaming X idea came from. Uh, the, the pilot projects I've been doing, and uh, a gaming X, it's uh, like the small think tank, yet small, uh, to help marginalized groups uh, in the city in several ways. Is um, focusing on advocacy, empowering communities, and uh, to shape their own environments and their own experiences. And uh, it's as well advocate for gender sensitive uh, designs and, uh, and theories uh, to promote gender equity and social justice. And uh, like a couple of years ago, I started to ask like uh, the question of how cities keep failing women and they're from their My Gender City uh, project came uh, like alive. And then uh, I've been um, I've been writing some of um, like my ideas about cities and uh, me being a feminist in, in many cities around the world. As I mentioned, I, I was born and lived in Dubai most of my life and I am Egyptian. So I've been in Cairo um, quite a lot as well. Uh, and my sister lives in the Netherlands and uh, and there where I am like open and visiting and staying for quite a time and uh, study. So um, uh, as well, I was writing because as long as I remember, I'm uh, I call myself a feminist too, and I started to uh, gather some of my own experiences in what I call the gendered city, and uh, and now it became as well uh, more like gathering and collecting uh, uh, offline and online from uh, data from different women and other gender minorities about how cities keep failing women. So. Um, 
it turned to a book that uh, I'm soon publishing with the same name, The Gender City. And, uh, and it's, it's about um, to understand the experiences and perspective of women and other minorities in cities, including mobility patterns, safety concerns, uh, access to economic and social opportunities. So, so yeah, <laughs> this is briefly uh, what I've been doing lately. <laughs> Uh, that's that's super exciting and as as i'm listening to you like i i hear a lot about amplifying the voices of women and of course your your phd project being the voices of maybe underrepresented groups or minorities in the society so why are you doing the work that you're doing is there something personally that makes you curious and passionate about this topic what what is it that yeah that led you here yeah, so um, so as I mentioned, uh, I am a woman of color, and uh, as far as I uh, remember being like even a kid, I started to read the feminist readings and all the feminist literary books. Uh, actually, I'm like I'm thankful for my dad for like putting me uh, in, in, and enlightening me into that direction. So my passion for feminism is something uh, in my identity, I would say, since since long time. And uh, and me being an urbanist and uh, and like loving the community and cities and how they intersect together and how uh, we shape our cities and hence it shapes us. I, I you know I can't um, I can't like uh, overlook my own personal experiences in the city as well. So um, being a woman of color, I um, like I realized that uh, spaces are perceived to notions of gender, race, ethnicity, class. So it's really intersectional layers of, uh, we would call it maybe bias uh, in, in my own self experiences. And, uh, and I, I love merging my, my feminist character into my uh, passion for cities and, uh, and people in the city. So, so this is why it, it's really my like passion, like project of passion, and uh, and this is why I'm like um, I'm, I'm trying to uh, to as well sh uh, share and amplify women's experiences that uh, what we call in feminism the ninety nine point nine percent women who didn't make it who are still struggling, and this is why I am uh, as well gathering some offline uh, uh, like. Um, uh, in, uh, answers from these women because it's really uh, like uh, they're not privileged enough even maybe to have access to the internet we have seen uh, like uh, a lot of experiences of women uh, collecting water and having this to, to go like four kilometers a day back and forth to to gather water for their families so it's in, in cities that lack the the infrastructure the sanitation infrastructure and it's women's job to 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 collect water and gather water so this i would say uh, amount of inequality uh, makes me a, a woman of color as well that uh, it, it really inter interferes with my life as well so yeah okay uh, so you, you you said also uh, you do a lot of interviews uh, as I do and you talk to, to a lot of women. So wh what were some of the things that, that you heard uh, from this woman? And so what are some of the ways that actually cities are failing women? Um, yeah, so, so I, will, I will start first like how cities are failing women and then I will share some of the uh, like um, individual um, uh, answers that I've I've had. Uh, so I think um, historically women been marginalized in many areas of the society, and uh, urban planning and design is no uh, exception. And and this uh, lack of representation and lack of diversity in decision making, and leadership, and in, in having some decision makers uh, uh, from different perspectives. It, it led to this uh, negative consequence of cities being designed uh, by and for men, for the uh, default male that, uh, as far as design itself is concerned, it's like everything was designed for the default male. So, um, and, the, and these uh, gendered norms and assumptions 
uh, are how cities were built. So uh, it resulted to urban spaces that privileged men's needs and activities uh, while marginalizing women's um, uh, perspectives and overlooking not only women, but uh, different uh, all the other spectrum of uh, marginalization. So um, as well, it's, it's the assumption that the men are the main breadwinners of the family and the women's primary role are in houses. Even in the houses prototypes, it, it was designed for it to, to like endorse or like in their gender norms. So and this this what has been cities and uh, and and prototypes and architecture uh, was designed and uh, till very recent and even in Western societies. So um, these gender norms that were embedded in urban design uh, through the design of transportation systems and through through the the design of our uh, streets network etc and everything it reflected this traditional uh, roles and the gender division of labor and uh, and exacerbated the segregation between men and women so it it has been years and years since as uh, cities were designed by and for women and uh, overlooking uh, women or gender uh, different gender identities or other marginalized uh, and intersectional marginalized perspectives like race class sexuality age and ability uh, etc so um so this is why and uh, and like till now i would say and we argue about that that it's uh, it's, n it's still not embodied in our policy and in our uh, municipalities and our uh, systematic designs at uh, the gender mainstreaming uh, idea that you need to um, look and uh, amplify other like the half of the population and more uh, perspectives into design and um, so, so we have like these two scenarios, the scenario that you are a father, uh, you are, have a job in the city center, so you commute to your work using a train uh, or your car, because uh, mostly if, if a household owns a car, it's, it's a male who is uh, uh, using the car. Uh, because of the pay gap, etc. So, and you return home. And the second scenario, so you're a pregnant woman with a toddler and a stroller. You navigate the stairs of a subway station, you search for a escalator or an elevator for the stroller, and then you are uh, afraid of the safety of you and your toddler in a poorly maybe lit platform. You try to entertain your child, you drop off the child at the nursery, then take another train to work, and maybe after work you will uh, pick up uh, like um, a senior or pick up the uh, grocery uh, shopping or do the gro grocery shopping, and then you uh, pick up your kid back and then you return home. So, and this is what we know in urban design, it's called trip chaining. And, uh, and for too long, the scenario of this and perspective of uh, of this woman who are maybe a caregiver uh, doing the, the care work because we know that women do uh, like more than 75% of the total care work. So all of these perspectives and experience of that woman uh, was neglected and is being neglected in many parts still uh, and overlooking the needs um, to, to like go from point A to point B, C and B. So, so this is how cities were built and, uh, and this is how cities were keep, keep failing women. And some of the responses actually, it was like from transgender women uh, that, uh, that she, she mentioned that uh, spaces are being hostile for her uh, since she was a boy. And then uh, this is like spaces that has been uh, and, and more of this hostile uh, came from uh, men and, and, uh, and boys and other boys. So, um, so this is like one of the responses and other uh, responses. Uh, and, and you can see maybe uh, Ghanaian uh, girls who are trying to hide their menstrual cycles in order to uh, continue their middle education. Because in, in Ghana, maybe uh, uh, in some parts, uh, if you are like, if you have your menstrual cycle, then you drop off out of school and then get married. And uh, and this is like uh, the, the struggle of women uh, fighting to, to just continue their uh, middle education uh, or to... Um, this basic right, I would say, uh, in life, it shows that it's a long, still way to redress this gender inequality, and uh, and some parts of the world are really 
uh, like uh, even like not mentioning the the decision makers percentage of women, they're only with, like fighting for their basic needs of um, maybe healthcare or education or uh, etc. So um, so yeah, these Thank are you. some of the things that uh, that you feel obliged as well to tackle or to to not overlook. No, definitely. And I, I think there are like in in the terms of safety and also when it comes, yeah, as as you're saying uh, about accessibility, I think a lot of us as as women, we are just accepting those things as norms, and a lot of times we we mm. might even be blind to it because that's how the things has been, and we are just just used to seeing it, and we don't even question. Uh, has there been something in one of your interviews that when you talk to a woman, they address something and you were like, oh my God, I, I, I've been just blind to this. I even didn't consider this as being something that is a result of a gendered city. Have you had any experience um, like that? Well, I, I would say that uh, living in the Middle East, it would really um, make you like living um, sexual harassment and harassment firsthand, I would say, because um, like walking in Cairo, you would uh, definitely be aware where you are exactly and uh, what are you uh, dressed in and uh, how how like and faster your rhythm is being fully aware of your surroundings so um so th there was really no surprises in that safety and security i would say but uh, but you see a lot of responses of women um as well in their different as we said this intersectional like age and and maybe aging women who are more afraid for this their security they they tend to use parks in in different uh, times of the day they they are very cautious about like and even they they feel how their uh, own like being still a woman but in different life cycles um they would mention that uh, like we can't go running after dark anymore i think now like i'm more afraid for my safety and security and this is how this intersectional layer as well of like age and and gender uh and and this is how like intersectional uh, lens is really vital to to as well tackle all of these issues so it's always like this intersectional layers uh, and the uh, and maybe like a woman of color, uh, etc. So, um, so being uh, like vo more vulnerable or less to harassment and uh, and and safety and security is really intersectional. So it's not only uh, uh, gender, but uh, but yeah, you would say that. Uh, and of course, you know that like research about like teen girls uh, not using playgrounds and uh, and and the la and this disparity in in physical activity for between. Uh, girls and, and boys uh, it really it amazes you how um, how unequal and uh, and can can be, can be the city can be restrictive to to certain um, uh, genders and identities so so yeah and I mean of course gender inequality let's say it's uh, it is a cultural issue I mean it's a very layered and deep-rooted issue uh, but if we were mm -hmm. to look at it from the design lens, what are some of the things that, that we can do in order to have more feminist cities, more feminist designs? Let's say if I'm an architect or an urban designer who is a woman, or I'm a feminist, or I care about amplifying women's uh, voices, and I'm in the studio and the decisions are being made, what are some of the things that I can bring to the table? Uh, so we 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 are sure that we are moving forward with this and we are moving towards a more feminist cities. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, so so we would, we say we start definitely with sex desegregated data. So if you're a researcher, a designer, you need to gather data to 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 first of all see how like the disparities are there and how if it's like the space is used to different um, genders and ethnicities, class, etc., and demographics. So you need to gather data that is um, like sex desegregated data that uh, to to study the various groups and and how to contribute and how you can like gather these data and represent it uh, to 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 inform your uh, designs. So incorporating this gender perspective uh, lens as well. 
uh, when when you are designing that and making sure that uh, we know now that uh, like successful design needs to be uh, participatory and like co-designing. So you need to be more inclusive in that sense and um, to, to, to have everyone represented. So it's super important for um, for the designers to represent different groups from different uh, genders and uh, and the minorities. So uh, so you have gender based statistics, you have uh, a, a, like studies that uh, promote this equitable and inclusive design. So you are gathering the perspectives from different sectors of the community. So uh, it's important as well to collect viable examples of like good practices. So what was successful in terms of inclusivity and what was not and why? Uh, and this is like gender mainstreaming. And, uh, and we see that uh, of course, it's not like uh, personal, uh, individual uh, steps, but it is. Of course, grassroots are uh, like important to address this. Uh, but as well, uh, policymakers and municipalities. So we have maybe a staff in the municipality that are not trained on gender mainstreaming. So you, so you need to train the staff on gender mainstreaming um, uh, perspectives. So um, and we we would say this by collecting viable. Uh, uh, like in good practices and, and successful uh, uh, like um, strategies and uh, and designs. So uh, and and of course, as you said, community engagement and, and participation, collaboration, uh, with this inclusive lens uh, to to like combine everyone's on the decision table. Uh, it's really important. And and yeah. <laughs> And you start like to 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 educate people that uh, feminism is not is not a bad word. It's like because it's stigmatized, uh, and even gender is stigmatized. And I know a lot of colleagues working in gender mainstreaming. They even uh, they they like call the municipality and tell them this is gender mainstreaming project, and we can do that and that. And they would say like, uh, but can we call it as anything other than gender? <laughs> so. And imagine feminist. Yeah. <laughs> so feminist is really a stigmatized word, and uh, and we need to educate people that it's not man hating. It's not to establish supremacy of women over men. It's it's only equality. Gosh, it's it's crazy that we still have to say this over and over again. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, yeah. I mean, um, if if we think that right now we have gendered cities and what we want to reach to possibly is feminist cities that are more inclusive are there is there a specific vision of how that would look like or it's still very much in the research phase and we have to like still educate people until to until yeah, to reach to that vision of how that would look like in practice or if there are design elements that would be added or it's yeah of course it's much more like complicated than that to say to add lights to the cities or things like that but yeah is is there a vision that we can look to and, and think that that would be a more feminist vision of a city yeah. so yeah i would say um so we know that no country in the world has reached gender equality like unfortunately but of course, we know like UNIA uh, and, and Vienna, they started like early on gender mainstreaming in the municipalities. So you would see some really uh, like uh, working um, examples of uh, designing with gender responsive lens. We have seen some now initiatives in and uh, like uh, redesigning uh, in uh, parks and recreational areas. Uh, like make space for girls and then and, and leads park safety and this is a research project but started to make like real implementations and prototypes for women for girls for teen girls uh to to have this like successful places that uh that works for everyone so they they did the sex desegregated data they have seen why would girls not use this space and what is the perception of uh, of safety for for certain uh, identities and and they started to inform design decisions accordingly so we have seen yeah some uh, some things working and then okay. hopefully we are like optimistic that it's it it will start to work and and more projects and more people are up to uh, to to change and and like be more uh, gender responsive we would say 
and and I love the quote, of course, that it's really we know that it's really a culture and and like a societal uh, ideas. So no amount of life will dismantle the patriarchy, and uh, and like no amount of life in the street will change like maybe objectifying women or harassment, etc. So it really involves this social factor of like. Um, of like avoiding gender stereotypes and challenging gender uh, like roles and uh, and using this empowering language as we said to uh, for equality and to and, and to like be more vocal about uh, the whole experiences of people needs to be uh, uh, listened to and put on the decision table. And uh, I mean. We, as you said also before, like feminism is is not a bad thing and it's not about supremacy or power or things like that. And when we talk about feminist cities, is that we want cities that actually work for everyone, not only for women or for uh, persons with disability or marginalized groups. Uh, So what are some of the negative effects of gendered cities that like some social, economic, environmental effects of these gendered cities that, yeah, on on our societies today that we can think about. That through feminist. Uh, yeah, exactly. Sorry, go. Yeah, so so we know that um, women have been like historically marginalized and silenced in many like areas of the society and including politics, business and media. We know that gender gaps exist and and some of them can exist because of the mobility uh, mobility aspect that you have spoken about like in the cities. So cities, because they're, everything we do is in our cities and our uh, built environment and homes that are designed by architects. So it really even like it restricts you or it, it, it does not. So it's uh, like having the gender city and having this hinders uh, while commuting, while uh, experiencing the city, it can really lead to um, to uh, like harmful uh, li- living and lifestyles. We know that it's, it really, uh, it's, 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 it has negative effects on physical activity because if you are uh, afraid like to train after dark and then you finish uh, your work like uh, and then it's dark and then you can't even like do your sports so these like uh, factors of uh, of uh, inequality and hinders uh, it, it really affects from physical activity to um to your own like psychological and uh, and maybe social life and then economic empowerment uh, so, so, so it really it 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 intersects with all layers of of life basically, and and we need to achieve uh, like uh, equality in different uh, uh, like view uh, like different sectors and uh, and and one of them is of course our designs and and prototypes and and cities definitely. Yeah. And uh, what, was there any point of history that the situation was better? Because I'm I'm really bad at history. So what, was this different when we were living in communities and villages? Is this something that started with, let's say, the Industrial Revolution? Or this problem always existed, like in our societies? Well, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> it, uh, it we, we would say that uh, it's historical bias and, uh, and and these gender roles they have been uh, this way. Of course, it was worse in in like some parts of the history for women. So uh, historically, women, uh, you know, they weren't even they have the right to vote. Uh, they didn't uh, like in Venice, women mostly. Uh, where like um, like the most they can see the street is from the terraces waving to to <laughs> ships going and coming. So so actually, I would say that uh, uh, like um, no, it's a long. It was a long um, walk for equality, and some of them is achieved, and and some is not yet achieved. Uh, but uh, the historical bias, unfortunately, is a thing, and uh, and it has been for uh, for too long. I don't know if, like, uh, I think it's it, it like even um, uh, like Simone de Beauvoir uh, in in the Second Sex, which which I call the Bible of Feminism, 
as she mentioned that even in the, like stone ages there was like this bias and, and women's uh, like um um were not uh, like um, they didn't have the equality people assumed that they had so so no unfortunately it's it's historically embedded and this is why it's really taking a lot of efforts and time to like steer the wheel uh, into more uh, equal egalitarian points yeah okay but but that's hopeful it means that we've been improving at least <laughs> like not that we <laughs> yeah, I would say, yeah. That now we are just going down so okay that's that's good um and yeah. uh, yeah, I have. I I was listening to a podcast a while ago, and uh, there was a mother who was talking about how the like societies today, but also the cities today. As soon as a woman becomes a mother, they it's like the whole society tells you to go. We we don't want to do anything with you and come back whenever you can be, you know, again economically uh, productive or things like that. Which that it in it itself it's it's a messed up thing in our societies, uh, but you, you talked about this before. But I wanted to a little bit get deeper in it um, about how, yeah. uh, yes, yeah, cities are failing maybe mothers in a specific or caregivers as as you mentioned, uh, who mm -hmm. most of them are are women. Uh, is it only about the accessibility issue? Uh, are there other layers to it uh, of yeah how cities are not designed for women or for young parents uh, or caregivers? Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, I listened to to a podcast. It's called "Pregnant Then Screwed," <laughs> and it really tackles how um, like this caregiving um, like work women like have to do. It it really uh, like puts their whole career on hold and um, and lead to this economic gaps and and the pay gap and uh, and uh, all of this negative as well economic impacts that can tackle uh, that can happen to women uh, so so yeah it's other than um, like uh, we know that transportation is, is not uh, optimally designed for strollers even our like uh, pedestrian uh, walkways can in many cities there there are not like uh, adequate pedestrian lanes for uh, strollers or people with disability and this is uh, something really important with accessibility and uh, and we have that um, yeah, like uh, urban poverty affects women uh, limiting the resources to to afford uh, adequate um, as we said uh, uh, maybe means of transportation and this is why active mobility and uh, and like um, women are two-thirds of using public transportation so it needs to uh to to as well be responsive to their needs and um so yeah it's like women are mainly the urban poor because of the pay gaps and because of uh, maybe they're uh, they they do the most of the care work even if it's not kids where uh, like uh, kids care work it's caring after senior citizens and and they do that um, mainly more than men so um so it all causes this economic uh, disparity and and like gaps in in the economic uh, power and and leads women to be more uh, the pr more percentage of the urban poor and uh, and and yeah it's, it's it's it makes it difficult for women to support themselves and and maybe if there are single uh, uh, families, so it, it's like it will be uh, uh, more systematically and more systematic barriers for women to 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 live uh, like more freely or to have this uh, necessary necessities uh, and to improve their economic situation. So so yeah, it it really um, tackles women more and and even if if not caregivers, so it's because they do mainly the the care work, the unpaid care work. Yeah, definitely. And and this uh, also fact that uh, like organizations or places of work are not flexible towards mothers, make us hear mothers' voices mm -hmm. less and less all the time. So we we even don't like hear about what is wrong and what is not addressed uh, for mothers and for caregivers because we even don't hear their voices uh, since yeah they cannot be there because of lack of flexibility so yeah that's also mm -hmm. <laughs> messed up so
So uh, you, again, you, you said this before uh, about using empowering language, and I I, I want to ask you this because I'm I'm personally curious about this. And of course, I mean, feminism and feminist cities is about involving as many people as possible and really building up the society together to make it better uh, in, in different ways. Uh, but how can we approach it uh, in a way not to create fear in, in parts of the population and really uh, increase curiosity instead of creating fear or judgment or even hatred, what is what do you think is the way to approach it so we can have more and more people wanting to join this movement uh, and wanting to yeah. be more inclusive? <laughs> yeah, so it's it's really important because, uh, as you said, it, it can... It can be like, like the, using wrong language. It can stigmatize like the whole feminist uh, and the whole equality uh, movement. And uh, and I would say that it's really it really starts like from um, fr like it's a role of everyone. So it starts from home, like with kids, and you, you start like uh, saying that uh, challenging the gender norms and challenging the the stereotypes that that we can see like the harmful stereotypes and biases that even in, in the t television or uh, in the in the media we, we see that maybe it uh, it promotes uh, this um like gen certain gender roles like putting women in kitchen cooking or maybe like uh, bosses are these uh, white heteronormative men so it's really important to Im to implement these feminist ideas into children's upbringing and promoting gender equality uh since young age and in, uh, like this includes encouraging girls to pursue non-stereotypical activities and interests and uh, teaching boys that it's like uh, the like about toxic masculinity and how it's um and how it's important to uh, to have as well uh, their their like um uh motives and goals achieved uh, rather than like boys should do that and girls should do that so it's important to encourage women more into STEM fields, sports, leadership position. Uh, so I would say that whenever someone tells you like you have uh, you have like uh, a certain like mood uh, rather than it's assertive. So these like different languages that uh, that women like um, in, in in power. Uh, we should like um, teach girls that it's it's like it's okay to be assertive. It's okay to be opinionated and to have. Uh, like uh, your own uh, vision and and uh, like uh, uh, what what ideas about what you want to be and uh, it's important to implement these feminist ideas and um, to promote critical thinking uh, in in kids to challenge as you said this uh, stereotypes and and biases that, uh, that that we can see around a lot still and um, and discussing this uh, biases and and this representation of maybe gender and race of different of, of certain uh, genders certain races and um and actually yeah yeah parents can be like a, an important model and feminist behaviors themselves and this is my personal experience in my household being from the middle east but having a really feminist parents and how it really changed my perspective so i pursued mm -hmm. the stem fields i pursued my own career and and i was really opinionated growing up and no one ever told me what to do and uh, it's really um it worked so even in the like most uh we would say uh, not progressive societies or like uh or societies that are like really uh, having these stereotypes and biases, it's really important to, uh, since like in the household from everyone actually from their their own position can challenge this uh, sexism and racism and homophobia attitudes and behaviors. Thank you. And if if we are to talk to someone who who is scared when we bring up the the word feminism or. <laughs> feminist cities <laughs> is is there a way to approach it is there a way to communicate uh in a healthy way yeah so it is always in a healthy way i think but it's it's important that uh 
that you are like um uh, yeah it's it's really it as as my me myself like being like saying i'm a feminist it can it can actually terrify some people <laughs> like they're okay <laughs> And that even in Western society, and I always say this, it's really amazing that uh, it's really not uh, like it's not really different. So, so you can say that a feminist urbanism is about, um, as we said, the ninety nine point nine percent. It's all the layers of uh, marginalization included. So it's it's only about challenging the traditional. Uh, we would say if it's feminist urbanism, so we are challenging the traditional urban planning and design paradigm. And that privileged one uh, gender less than fifty percent of of people, and and really didn't manage to um to to listen and take into account the others' experiences in cities. So we only raising questions about like who who plans the city and what was normal and what is the norm, uh for too for too uh, long and what is not working for uh, for the others. So it, it's it's really this like um. It comes and emerges from the long-standing struggles of women uh, in cities, and the, and the, and it is about to transform uh, this like struggles into more egalitarian systems and more equal uh, representation for everyone. So it's uh, it will work for men definitely, and uh, and we are saying that it can work for other people. So it's it's really about this. Uh, inclusive and holistic um, points of view, uh, and 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 everyone to be represented and and taken into account. So, uh, so feminist is equality, and, uh, and and we really need to question our privileges and and our um, uh, like every one of us is, is maybe privileged in something and not privileged in others. So we need to privilege to ask you know, like to question our privileges if we want to move forward with this more inclusive egalitarian uh societies so so yeah it's it's for everyone and it will definitely work for men but we want it to work for everyone else so it's not anti men <laughs> <laughs> and i i think that maybe when we are having the conversations maybe it's also important to say that we are not critiquing men per se but we are critiquing critiquing a system that is affecting negatively mm -hmm. all of us not uh yeah so we are not addressing men it's not their fault we've all been born in this system that is not serving <laughs> any of us uh so yeah mm -hmm. they, they are not the issue we are we are talking about the system um yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I um, I I wanted to like close uh, with uh, asking you about mm -hmm. what you wrote about fifteen minutes city. Uh, there has been these uh, talks lately. I I know this this is not the focus of our conversation today, but I I just wanted to uh, share what you wrote and what has been going on uh, with with the fifteen minute cities and. Yeah, the articles that have been published for just for the sake of awareness raising. So maybe we can close the conversation with this. Thank you. Yeah. So um, yeah, fifteen minutes city is like uh, as we said, women are are the most like uh, it works for women more, and it's it's a system that includes caregiving, includes includes strip chaining, uh, embodiment into the system. But we know that. Uh, a gentrification happen and uh, and as we call it genderification and and as we mentioned mostly uh, urban poor are women uh, so it really to it needs to have this uh, in my point of view it has it needs to have this feminist lens and uh, and and like to to make more uh, 15 minute cities and to make more walkable neighborhoods in order to uh, to, to like stop gentrification from happening uh, and and like similarly the Subarilla project and it's like it's amazing to see the super blocks and and it's more pedestrianized like the Piazza Aperti in Milan and uh, and to have this more com uh, like neighborhood feely and like more pedestrian walking and, and it really endorses a uh, physical activity proximity and and we all love uh, these concepts but as well it's important to 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 like um, 
to take care from gender uh, gentrification and to, to maybe to have it more in the city. So uh, we know that some parts of Barcelona is like uh, really uh, raise the rent, the parts that are, are, are attached to, to the Suburela. So it means it works. It means that people need it more and it means that we need to make it more in order not to have it this gentrified and, and maybe eventually uh, harm, harming uh, women too. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Noran, so thank much. You. Is there anything else that you would want to share before we close? Uh, no, I'm, I was really uh, happy in this conversation with you today, Arizo, and raising all of these uh, uh, issues about uh, intersections between feminism and urbanism, uh, really. So thank you. Thank you so much, Noran. Uh, you can... Uh, Follow Noran's LinkedIn, and uh, she she's been doing so many interesting works. Uh, she's been uh, writing a book. Uh, she does interviews, and uh, you can check all of her works from there. I'm gonna also include the links to 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 your works in in the podcast. And if you like what you heard, uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel and follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all, all those places. Uh, so thank you again, Nuran. Uh, it was really great talking to you. And yeah, see you maybe around, maybe see you in Leco. <laughs> Thank you, Arizo. Yeah, definitely. Now we, we need uh, we need to have coffee and Leco. And thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, it, it was my pleasure. Again. Bye.